I believe that today we're moving in a time when it does cost you something to be a Christian. But apparently, friends, we're moving in an orbit today where Christianity is becoming, and I mean real Christianity, is becoming very unpopular, and Christians are. Welcome to Through the Bible. We have the privilege to study God's Word today, something that many people in the world will never have. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host and fellow Bible student on the Bible bus. And you know, not long ago, I visited with someone who serves the Lord in a very difficult part of the world. And he was telling me how people in the country where he lives risk their lives in order to simply talk about God. And as soon as they quote a scripture verse, they commit it to memory because it's a criminal offense to even own a Bible. And they would be in prison for 15 years if they're caught with one. And you know, that made me think about what we get to do every day. And my heart is overwhelmed with the privilege that we have to study God's Word together. I pray that we never take it for granted ourselves. Dr. McGee once said he believed we're moving into a time when it's going to cost us something to be a Christian. And if that's true, I'm even more grateful for what we're learning. We'll be better equipped with the knowledge of God's Word, and then we're going to be stronger in our faith in God because of what we're learning today. Now, in our study, Dr. McGee instructs us on a day when everyone does what's right in his own eyes and when truth is twisted into error. He calls them days of apostasy. Sounds a bit like today, doesn't it? So turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and let's welcome Through the Bible's president with an update on our exciting home group movement that's going on literally around the world. That's right, Steve. And you and I have both had pretty extensive exposure to the different places and, and the, the ideas around the home groups. If you're new, it's just a home Bible study using Dr. McGee's systematic teaching in your language. And we gather groups of about seven to 10 people. It's all over South Asia, and it's now moved into Africa. But as always, Steve, let's hear the fruit. Yes. This first one is from Tripura, India, on the Coke Baroque Bible bus. And this is so typical, by the way, before I start, of so many people listen in India as well as in Bangladesh. We saw this, Greg, this first sentence. I grew up in a Hindu Mm -hmm. family. Since childhood, my parents worshipped millions of gods. I used to follow them, too. Last year, a home group leader invited me to join his group. Since then, I have listened regularly to the Bible. The Word of God changed my life. I now know that Jesus is my Savior. He died for me. He rose again from death. I accepted him in my life. Please pray for me so that I can draw closer to him and my faith can grow. And Steve, that that's supernatural. That, yeah. that, that story does not happen in any natural way. It has to be divine. Yeah, and this t- story is also so typical of the attendance, particularly in Bangladesh, yeah, that's right. where a third of the listeners or a third of the participants in those home groups are They're Hindu. not believers. Yeah, yeah, they're not Christians. Or Muslims. Yeah. Or Muslims, yeah. yeah. And they come and they're willing to listen to God's word. Pretty cool. Now, let's go from there to West Bengal, India, which is actually on the eastern part of India because it's just west of Bengal, but it's the Bengali Bible bus. I am the leader of our home group. For many years, I lived a worldly life. After studying with you, I understood the mistakes I made. I came to Jesus and I submitted my life to him. My cycle of sin was broken. Mm, Amen. Yes. He goes on. As a group, we now listen to the word of God on the media player regularly. Listening, I have grown in my faith and my personal relationship with God has developed. Mm, Wow. Such an encouragement. We got time for another one. This is from a Bengali Muslimi Bible bus listener and home group participant. I enjoy the home group and have learned a lot through the systematic Bible teaching and try to apply it in my personal life. Paul's life in the book of Acts has taught me a lot. It is like a high-level course in leadership and patience. I aspire to be more like Jesus in my home and in my church. Thank you all. (laughs) And Steve, when we do these uh, dialogues, we talk together, we read the listener letters and viewer letters and apps and digital, it just blows your mind that this teaching of Dr. McGee's is literally touching people all over the world. It is such an encouragement. Let me pray for us, Greg, as we begin. Heavenly Father, I pray for those home group participants that are all over the world, but specifically in this part of the world, in India and the region around there, that you would continue to grow them in their faith. And I pray now, too, as we open the study into 2 Timothy, that you would open our eyes to see what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's Dr. J. Vernon McGee with our study on 2 Timothy 3 on Through the Bible. 
Now, friends, today, as we return back, actually, we'll begin at the eighth verse of the third chapter of 2 Timothy. We rushed over this section last time, and I want to slow down enough to pick up some very important things that we'd like not to miss. I'm reading now verse 8, Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Now, Paul in this chapter is telling us about the apostasy that would come in the last days, and he gives the warning concerning it. These days would be desperate days. They would be, as our translation has it, perilous days. I have no objection, don't misunderstand, with that translation, but actually desperate days would be a good translation also. Then he described the characteristics of those days that would come. And I believe that we're in that particular period now. I do not know how much longer it'll last or how much worse it'll get. I'm sure that it's going to get worse and not better. Now, Jannes and Jambres here were the names of the two magicians that Pharaoh called in when Moses, you remember, began with the miracles when the plagues came upon Egypt. The interesting thing is that for the first two or three, these magicians could imitate. But then when it proceeded, they saw that it was the hand of God there and that things were taking place they could not duplicate. Well, there are several things to note here. First is, we'd never know the names of these magicians if Paul hadn't given them to us. Now, that opens up a great reservoir of speculation. Where did Paul get the names of the two? My simple answer is that it was revealed to him by the Spirit of God. I do not think that it adds much information to us today, but it reveals, I think, something that's quite interesting, that Paul knew the names of them. Not only they're not nameless magicians, but they had names, real individuals. They did withstand Moses, and that account is given back in the seventh chapter of Exodus, and you can read about them in the eleventh verse. I'm not going to turn to that at all. Now, it reveals also two things, that Satan has power. He has supernatural power. And also that he's a great little imitator, and he imitates the things that God does. And these men were able to do what Moses did. Moses did it by the power of God. They do it by the power of Satan. And I believe that this is the reason this is given to us is to understand that in our day, Satan can imitate the power of God. And I'm afraid that in many places, there is the manifestation of the power of Satan and not the power of God, and it's misunderstood. That's the reason John warned us and said, try the spirits, see whether they be of God or not. And that is something that we should do. Now, we're told to turn away from this type of thing. These men resist the truth. They are men of corrupt minds. And the word reprobate here means cast away. It means they have discarded the faith. They have rejected it totally. Now, I think that we have a classic example in our day. We had a bishop out here of the Episcopal Church on the West Coast, a man apparently of tremendous ability. But the fact seemed to be that even his family and he from the very beginning delved in that which was spiritualistic this type of thing that borders on the supernatural. Now, this man, as best I can tell, had rejected the great truths of Scripture. And he made a trip to Palestine, and it's my understanding that he intended to attempt to disprove some of the great truths of the Word of God. Well, he didn't disprove any of the truths, but he certainly proved some of them, 
And I think this is one of them. I actually believe that it's a strange thing that happened out there for that man to die as he did. Now, I don't propose to offer any kind of an explanation other than here is a classic example of that. A man that apparently at one time professed to believe something. Then there came a day when he became, as the scripture says, reprobate. Uh, cast away, he discarded the faith. Now, he says, but they shall proceed no farther, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. And I think today that what happened to this man ought to be a tremendous lesson to Christians. Now, you can dabble in this thing if you want to, but you're dabbling in something that's quite dangerous, because actually, there is a manifestation of satanic power about us. And in this day of crass materialism, it's a strange anomaly that there is also the manifestation of a supernatural power. And there's some men that are rather startled to discover that because they had rejected the supernatural altogether. But a great deal of it is satanic, of course. Now, I read on verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, patience. You see, Timothy knew Paul, knew him well. And Paul's life was an open book, and a Christian's life ought to be that. Now, verse 11, he continues. Timothy knew about his persecutions, his afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch at Iconium. And this is Antioch of Pisidium, and Iconium, and Lystra. And these places are in the Galatian country where Paul went on his first, his second, and his third missionary journey. Now, on his first missionary journey, he was stoned at Lystra and left for dead, and I think was dead. God raised him from the dead. Paul said God intervened in his behalf here. And he says, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now, this was where Timothy lived, was in that area. It's where his mother and his grandmother, his family lived. His father, Greek, was from that area there. Now, Paul says, you know all about this. And you know what I've gone through. And verse 12, and yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, I believe that today we're moving in a time when it does cost you something to be a Christian. Now, I gave a quotation yesterday for Mr. Melvin Ladd that the press gave at the time several years ago of the convention up at San Francisco. And I do not know the circumstances under which he made this statement, but he said, in this world, it's becoming more and more unpopular to be a Christian. Soon it may become dangerous. Now, he apparently knows something that I don't know, and maybe you don't know. But apparently, friends, we're moving in an orbit today where Christianity is becoming, and I mean real Christianity, is becoming very unpopular, and Christians are. I am not really moved today by the press when they talk about the freedom of the press and how a reporter that won't reveal his source is put in prison. The bleeding heart press today has played that for all it's worth. But have they said anything about the fact today that real Christianity is stifled by the press? When was the last time that you read a sympathetic write-up of the Bible position today? May I say to you, they would give a man like Bishop Pike front page notoriety, but there's many a uh, fundamental preacher that man of, I think, greater ability than this man was, even intellectually, but given no publicity. Why? Because we really don't have freedom of the press. And you say, what do you mean? Well, I mean simply this, that the press will stifle and shut off news that presents real Christianity. And if you get any publicity at all, they'll misrepresent you. And not only that, if a preacher commits murder, he'll make the front page. But if he saves a group of people from going to hell, why, they discard him. 
I'm saying today that we're moved into an orbit, friends, when we may know what it is to pay a price to stand for Christ. Now he goes on to say, verse 13, and will you notice that here, but evil men and seducers. Now, seducers here, it's interesting to note, are sorcerers, are imposters, either one. Evil men and seducers shall become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That is, leading people astray, and then in turn being led astray themselves. Now, this is a picture of the last days. Now, what can a child of God do in days like these? Here's what he says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Verse 14, I'm reading, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, what is the antidote today in this world of apostasy? The antidote is the Word of God. What is the resource and the recourse of a child of God today? The Word of God. It's the only recourse. It is the only place that we can turn in a day like this. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. And he says that from a child, though, he had known the Holy Scripture. You see, his grandmother and his mother had taught him the Word of God. They were Jewish mothers, and they had taught him the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. Now he says they're able to make thee wise unto salvation. What kind of salvation? Timothy was already saved at this time. I think that salvation is in three tenses. And I think that we always need to look at it like that's the past tense. I have been saved from sin. And present tense, I am being saved from sin. And third, I shall be saved from sin. I have been saved. Christ bore a judgment debt, and we pass from death to life, and we're not under condemnation today. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. But we are being saved today also. He's working out a salvation in us. And we won't even have that perfected in this life. But as we look into the future, there is coming a day that, beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Now, I think that what Paul's talking about here, that the Scripture not only gives you the modus operandi of being saved, that is, passing from death to life and having eternal life and becoming a child of God. But it is the Word of God that saves you in this present evil world, enables you to grow, gives you deliverance down here. That's one of the reasons we're teaching. And we believe that the constant study of the Word of God is the only help that any of us has. Now he says that it is able to make the wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And I think it makes you wise in how to live down here. Now he says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now when he says all Scripture, he means all, friends. Genesis to Revelation. Now somebody's going to say that, well, didn't you know that Revelation hadn't been written at this time? I sure do. <laughs> but the important thing is, is to know that Revelation became Scripture. And Paul here is covering it all. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that word inspiration means it's God-breathed. These men, actually, they were not pens that the Lord picked up and wrote with them. But the marvel of it is that he used these men's personality, expressed things in their thought patterns, and yet he got through exactly what he wanted to say, and God has given us his word, and he hasn't any more to say to us. If God opened heaven and spoke out of heaven today, he wouldn't add anything to what he's already said, friends. He has said it, and he hasn't any more to say to us. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 
that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly is the word, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, will you look at that for just a moment here? Because this is important for us to understand. It is good for doctrine, that is, for teaching. That's the reason we teach it. The Bible is to be taught. And it's good for reproof. That's conviction. It should bring conviction to us. And it's good for correction. And if the Spirit of God is working, it'll bring conviction to our hearts. That's the way you can test where the Word of God is moving in your life. If you read this book like you read any other book, then may I say to you, the Spirit of God's not moving. This book's different. And it's given by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is the one that must use it. If it's not meaning anything to you, then it's just like any other book to you. Now, it's for correction. That is setting things right in your life. And it's to do that. And it's for instruction. And that means discipline. The Word of God is to discipline us. Now it says that the man of God may be perfect. Well, that doesn't mean that you and I are going to reach the kind of perfection you and I think of today, but it means full maturation. You'll be a complete, full-grown man. There are a lot of baby Christians around today, thoroughly furnished. That is, the Word of God can fit you out for life for every good work. And that's the reason, friends, that I don't buy all these little programs and these little systems and these little methods. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all of it is used today in order to meet your need. Now, let me say something here. Some that say, how do you know it's the Word of God? You want to know how I know? And I could give many reasons, but I'm going to give the one here because you can prove it's true. How do you prove it's true? Well, God says, taste to the Lord and see whether he's good. And he says here that the word of God is profitable. And here's what it'll do. I have right here on my desk right now about 500 letters. I know what it'll do. And I have those around me today. And they're willing to testify I believe that the Word of God is as much a fact, and you can prove it, as much as you can prove any problem of geometry or any scientific fact today. This is what the Word of God will do. Will it do it? It does it. And it's geared into life. I tell you, this book gets right down where the rubber meets the road. It walks in shoe leather today, and that's the proof of it, and that's the thing that makes me know it's the Word of God. Now, friends, that brings us to the end of chapter 3. Now we come to chapter 4, and we have Paul giving here first instructions for the last days. And then we are going to have this man here give us his deathbed testimony. And that, I think, is probably in his last words. And it'll be sad. This book of 2 Timothy has in it a note of sadness. And I hope you've detected also there's a note of loneliness here. Paul is alone yonder in Rome, and he's saying to this man, Timothy, I want you to hurry up and come be with me. He's lonely. And he's down yonder in that Mamertine prison. He says, I want you to bring my cloak. And he's cold down there. I've been down in that prison. I tell you, I'd hate to be put there. And Paul says, the hours are long. Bring my books, my parchments. I need to study. And now we're going to see Paul actually on his deathbed. And there is that note of sadness and loneliness. But you're going to find something else here. And that's going to be the note of victory. And you're going to hear him give it the last charge. And I actually believe that when you listen to him, as we'll listen to him next time, that you're hearing from God the thing that he wants you to hear. This is his last word for you. And if you're not prepared to accept this and receive this, I don't think he's got anything else to say to you. <laughs> this is it. We'll see it next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
know, we got so much more to learn from our study of 2 Timothy. So let's meet here again next time as the Bible bus rolls back by your corner. Until then, if you want to be in touch with us, call 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit ttb.org. And as always, we're so grateful for your company today on the Bible bus. God bless you as you walk with him in his word. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?